Number six in our series on uh, cycling biomechanics is going to shift gears, haha, a little bit. And for uh, this paper and for most of the rest of the papers in this section, uh, we're going to talk less about the biomechanics of the rider's body and a little bit more about the mechanics and the, the design of the bicycle itself and how some uh, non-traditional elements of bicycle design that deviate from the typical common design of a modern bicycle can uh, interact with the rider's biomechanics and physiology to improve uh, performance related metrics in cycling. Um, what they developed here in this study, this is a, a 2002 paper by Zamparo et al titled Mechanical Efficiency of Cycling with a New Developed Pedal Crank. Um, what they designed here and what figure one is, is supposed to be showing. It's not, maybe not uh, entirely clear, so I'll try and give you a, a demonstration of, of what it's actually doing on my bike. Is on a typical bike, if I zoom in here on their picture of a bike, um, this piece in the middle here that is centered on that front chain ring, um, that is the cranks of the bike. And there, we keep talking about the crank. There's actually two cranks. There's a crank on the right side which is this one pointing down here, and there's a crank on the, on the left side, which is this other one uh, pointing up here. Okay, so two cranks, one for the right leg and, and one for the left leg. Um, that crank on a, on a typical bike is typically a fixed length, meaning it's just like a, a rigid piece of material, and the distance from the center of the crank axis to the pedal is just some fixed distance. Yeah, there's, there's no way to change it, it's just a rigid uh, piece of material, and so that, that crank length is, is the same. Uh, no matter where you are in your pedaling cycle here, it doesn't matter if you're at top dead center, bottom dead center, anything in between on either side, the length of the crank is, is a constant uh, uh, distance on the bike. Um, what they developed here, and what is shown here in these diagrams, is a crank that is not a constant length um, from the center of the crank out to the pedal. And if it's not entirely clear what you're looking at here in these diagrams, um, uh, what they have here as labeled uh, number one in the figure is, is the crank itself, like the piece of the bike we typically call the crank. Um, number two here is the pedal. This kind of goofy looking thing is, is what your, your, uh, your, your cycling shoe would clip into and would attach uh, to the crank. And so this is the part that you would press on with your feet to, to generate power on the crank. Um, four here is the axis of rotation. This is the, the center of the crank. This is where the axis would go, and the, the center of that front chain ring about which you would generate torque and generate power to, to power the bike and, and get it up to and to maintain a certain speed. Okay. Um, the innovation that they added here is this circular part up here at the top. Okay. Um, the mechanics of it are a little bit difficult to describe here in, in a static picture, um, but it's got this kind of geared... Um, ball bearing mechanism in it here such that the um, effective length of the crank or the distance from the center of the crank axis here um, out to the pedal, the point that you press on with your feet, um, that distance actually changes depending on where you are in the pedaling cycle. Um, in particular, when you are at the very front of your pedaling cycle, like when your uh, foot that you're pressing down on the pedal with is as far in front of the crank axis as possible, which is typically called a 90 degree position, the distance from the crank axis here, that I'm highlighting with my mouse, um, out to the pedal, the point that you're actually pushing on, which is this uh, larger circle here, is maximized. Okay. And then on the other hand, when I get to the opposite side of the pedaling cycle, the position typically called uh, 270 degrees, um, where the foot is as far behind the crank axis as possible, then my distance from my crank axis to my uh, point of force application of my pedal, which is again this other circle here, is uh, as short as possible. Okay. And how is it doing this? Well notice here in this top figure the point of application of the force pedal or the axis of, of the force pedal is as far away from here as possible. It's like clear up here on the top of this mechanism that they built. And then when I'm on the other side, when I'm at the 270 degree position, I'm clear at the bottom of this mechanism. Okay. So changing the length of my crank by whatever this distance happens to be here that I'm highlighting, which looks to be ballpark maybe like a, a quarter of the, of the whole length of the crank, so pretty, pretty substantial distance, um, changing it by, by plus or minus that much um, depending on where you are in the pedaling cycle. Okay.
Now, why is that beneficial? Why is that a helpful thing? When, when they, when, when in this uh, study, when they tested this crank um, at low power levels for endurance cycling, it didn't really do anything. Um, at higher power levels, specifically at the highest uh, power level they tested, which was about uh, four watts per kg. So if you go back at the previous video and look at the like uh, cycling talent and fitness levels I posted, four watts per kg was like uh, a, a very competitive uh, local cyclist. It's not going to make you like a national class rider or a pro or anything, but that's a pretty solid uh, power output for, for a distance uh, focused cyclist. Um, so at the highest power output they tested in this study, when you used this uh, prototype uh, non-traditional crank versus a traditional crank, your uh, rate of oxygen consumption that you needed to, to produce that power decreased by about 3%. And your uh, mechanical efficiency, the uh, ratio between the power output and the energy consumption, uh, increased by about 2%. So 3% uh, more economical, 2% more efficient. Um, if that was a running shoe, we would, we would love it. It would be super important. And for cycling, this is also super important. This is a, a major improvement in, in performance, at least in theory, if you can uh, reduce uh, oxygen costs by a few percent and increase mechanical efficiency by a few percent. Okay, why does this work? Why is this a good idea? Um, to motivate that, I'm going to turn back to reading number two here on cycling, this Turpin and Wadier paper. And here I'm looking at their figure one again, and I'm going to zoom in here on the part on it on the right. And just to remind you of what this is, this is showing um, as I go through my pedaling stroke, as I go from top dead center to pressing down and moving my foot in front of the crank axis, and then continuing down to bottom dead center, and then moving my foot back up behind the pedaling axis and then returning here to uh, top dead center. Um, those little black arrows that you see there are the uh, force vectors that I'm pushing on the pedal with while I'm, while I'm doing the pedaling. So important thing to notice here is that note that these black arrows, the direction of this force on the pedal, is always oriented downward. Okay, sometimes it's, it's got a larger downward component than, the other, than, than in other places. In some places, it's, it's a larger force that's got a, a more overall downward directed force, and in some places, it's more lateral. But no matter where you are throughout your pedaling stroke here, the force is always pointed at least slightly downward, or for the last quarter of it here, there's essentially no force. Okay? There is never an upward directed force. Okay? Um, that is meaningful because... As long as my force is directed downward for this first half of the pedaling cycle here, then those forces are going to produce clockwise torques here. That's going to produce power that's going to contribute to the speed of my bike. It's going to contribute to my performance. Um, that is because these forces, or at least the downward component of the forces on this side, get multiplied by this positive moment arm, which is just the length of the crank, and that produces a positive torque. Okay. On the other side, though, notice that these forces, they're a lot smaller, but they're still overall oriented downward. Their, uh, their vertical component is still a downward component. But now, since I'm on the other side of this crank axis here in the middle, um, those forces are going to get multiplied by a negative moment arm here, and they're going to produce counterclockwise torques. Okay. So for the first half of the pedaling cycle here, I'm producing torques that contribute to the, the power that I want to, to maintain my speed on the bike. And, but for the second half, or at least the last quarter of the pedaling cycle here, I'm producing forces that actually subtract from the power that I'm trying to produce. They're producing uh, torques in the opposite direction of the power that I want to contribute to the, to, or at least to contribute performance-wise to the kinetic energy of the bike. Okay. Now, where do these forces come from? Why don't I just produce like positive forces on this, on this other side here when I'm going from bottom dead center back up to the top of the pedaling cycle? Why don't I just produce positive forces there? Why, 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 why? This seems like that's an easy solution. Um, let me pull up a video here to demonstrate to you what I'm talking about there, so you can hopefully visualize these things. And let me get on the other side of my bike here, so hopefully it's in the same direction as what I'm demonstrating in the paper. Okay, let's make that a little bigger, and let's make it so we can see the whole bike, hopefully. 
Okay. Um, I've got both of my, my shoes on here, but I'm just going to clip in on, on the one side to start with. We'll use both sides here eventually. Okay, and let's increase the gear a little bit, a little resistance going. Okay, so here I am doing my pedal stroke just unilaterally with my right foot, and that's all. My left foot is not connected and is not pedaling right now. Um, so you might wonder, well, I'm at top dead center here. Let's just freeze it at, at top dead center. And I contribute positively to powering the bike forward when I'm pressing downward on the pedal until I get here to bottom dead center. Then, if I want to continue to produce power in that direction, then I can't push down on the pedal anymore. Now I've got to pull up on the pedal. Okay. I've got to generate upward directed forces on the pedal um, once I get past here. Once I get past bottom dead center, I then have to pull up on the pedal and generate upward directed pedal forces to, to keep turning the crank. Okay. Um, generally, cyclists don't do that. You don't see upward directed forces in, of any substantial size in, in most uh, cyclists. And why is that? Why, why, why don't cyclists pedal like that? Um, that would seem to be one of the big benefits from having these shoes here that clip onto the pedals. Like if I just have my foot here and I'm clipped out and I'm just sitting on the pedal, then I push down on it, but I'm not connected to my pedal and I can't pull up on it, right? I've got to kind of push it real hard here and ideally just through its own momentum and inertia get it back up to the top so that I can continue pedal. Um, that's the real benefit of having shoes that clip on here, at least that's what people suspect is the benefit of having shoes that attach here rigidly to the pedals and that now I can produce, if I can get it on here, sorry, there we go, um, now I can produce uh, torque that contributes to the power, pos positively to the power of the bike throughout the pedaling cycle. Um, in theory, you can do that, but remember we learned a few lectures ago that training people to direct their pedaling forces like that generally increases your metabolic cost of pedaling and generally reduces your efficiency of pedaling. Um, this is typically because when I'm pulling up like this, or like actively going from here up to here, I'm using uh, pretty small muscles and using them in a way that they're not typically used to being used a lot of the time, and so uh, generally producing a, a, a muscle contraction that's not very efficient. Okay. So I can actually save on some energy cost of pedaling by only ever producing these big downward forces from bottom dead center, or sorry, from top dead center down to bottom dead center here. And then at bottom dead center here, I just kind of start ramping things down and, and, uh, get, and just kind of flow back up to the top here. Now, how the heck do I flow? I just use that kind of unscientific term, flow. How do I flow back up to the top here if I'm not actually pulling on the pedal? It looks like I have to pull on the pedal to go from here up to here. So how the heck do I do that by not producing upward forces on the pedal? Well, that's where my other foot here comes in. So let's clip in my other foot. So notice here that whatever position in the crank cycle my right foot is in, my left foot is in the opposite side of the crank cycle. So when my right foot is in top dead center at the very top of the crank, or at the very top of the pedaling cycle, my left foot is in bottom dead center at the very bottom of the pedaling cycle. And this is just a, a geometric inevitability of the bike. Um, similarly, when my right foot is here at 90 degrees of the pedaling cycle, so as far in front as can be, my left foot is at 270 degrees, as far behind the, uh, the crank axis as it can be. So the reason that when I get to the bottom here, when I get to bottom dead center with my right leg, that I don't have to actually pull up to get back up to top dead center is that with my right leg here, I get down to the bottom and then I shut things down because my left leg here is now at the top. And I can get my right leg back to the top by just powering down here with my left leg, okay? So that's why in pedaling you really don't see any substantial uh, upward directed forces, even, even with clip-in shoes, um, 
any time in, in, throughout most of the pedaling cycle. Sometimes you might see some small ones and some people might pedal like that, but it's generally not something you observe on average in like efficient cycling technique. We tend to only produce uh, downward directed forces on the uh, crank and tend to produce basically all of our power that actually contributes to the speed of the bike during the downstroke, which is this part going from top dead center here to bottom dead center. Now, how does this relate to the benefits of this crank arm in the present study, which is a non-constant length? Why is that a good thing? Well, let's return to our drawing here of pedaling forces and see if we can illustrate it there. So what's happening here is, like I said, when I'm producing these downward forces from top dead center, all the way to bottom dead center, so kind of like the front half of my, my pedaling cycle, um, those downward forces or the downward component of those forces get multiplied by this moment arm here, the length of the crank essentially, and that product is the torque that I produce about the axis here. And that's going to uh, be what causes uh, the power that uh, contributes to the kinetic energy of my bike. So. While my right leg is here at 90 degrees, for example, producing this little downward force that's going to produce a positive power about my crank axis here, my left leg, because of the geometry of the crank, I'm always pointing in opposite directions, is going to be over here at 270 degrees and is going to be producing this little downward force here. That downward force is going to get multiplied by this negative moment arm here and is going to produce a negative torque that's going to subtract from my total torque that I'm producing on the crank. So in order to maximize my torque that I produce about the crank and maximize my power that contributes to kinetic energy of the bike, ideally I would not like my crank here to be a constant length. Right? Ideally I would like my crank to be relatively long on this side from top dead center down to bottom dead center. And then I would like it to shorten up. Then I'd like it to get relatively short from bottom dead center here up to the top. Okay? Um, that's so that these little downward directed forces from the second half of the pedaling cycle then get multiplied by a much shorter but still negative moment arm here. And so they're still producing some negative torque that's going to uh, kind of fight against the, the work that I'm doing over here, but it's not going to contribute to it as much, and especially won't, won't contribute to it as much, won't take away from it as much if this moment arm or this crank length, when I want it to be positive, is, is even longer. Okay. So that's exactly what they designed with their mechanism here in this uh, study. They created a, uh, a, a crank mechanism that is relatively long from top dead center to bottom dead center and relatively short from bottom dead center to uh, top dead center on the second half of the pedaling stroke. Okay. Um, this minimizes the contribution of these little negative downward directed forces um, without requiring you to modify your uh, pedaling techniques such that you try to generate upward directed forces which isn't actually very efficient and economical for most cyclists. And did this work pretty well? It actually worked reasonably well for only one specific case, though. Um, the results are down here in uh, Table 1. Um, there's, a, there's a host of, of data here. I'm just going to highlight a, a couple of them. Um, any number in here that you see a star by, um, that's a case where that variable was significantly different between uh, PP here, which is the, the prototype crank, the special crank that they built, uh, compared to SP here, the standard crank, which is the typical you know, fixed, uh, fixed length crank that's always the same length, whereas PP here was a crank of variable length depending on where you were uh, in the pedaling cycle. Um, each of the rows here where it says 51, 100, 150, 200, 270, um, each of those rows is uh, five different power levels or five different intensities of cycling that they tested them at. Um, for each of the four first power levels here, so for the four uh, lowest levels of, of power that they tested, there was no significant difference in any of the variables between the prototype crank and the standard crank. Um, however, at the highest power level, which was about 
270 watts, which for these cyclists was uh, a little bit under four watts per kg, which is which is pretty good. If you're a four watts per kg cyclist, you'll be pretty competitive on, on your local scene, unless your local scene is, is unusually competitive. That's, that's a decent power output for a cyclist. Um, at that highest power output that they tested, the VO2, the rate of oxygen consumption, was 3.72 liters per minute with the uh, new crank versus 3.84 liters per minute with the uh, old crank. That's an improvement or a reduction with, with the uh, prototype crank of about 3%. Um, from that, because they had a little bit higher power with the uh, prototype crank and a little bit lower oxygen consumption, they also got an improvement here in uh, mechanical efficiency. It was about 23.4% with the special crank versus about 22.1% with the, uh, uh, the standard crank. And that's, that's about a 2% in uh, improvement in uh, efficiency. Two, not, not actually like 2% in terms of the uh, difference, but uh, two, uh, the, the uh, uh, prototype crank was 2% uh, of, of the efficiency of the uh, original crank more efficient, right? Like if you take the difference between 23.4 and subtract 22.1 and then divide by 22.1, it's about 2% about higher. Not, not adding 2% to the efficiency, that would be remarkable, uh, but about 2% uh, of the original efficiency of the original uh, crank, if that, if that makes sense. So about a 3% improvement in oxygen consumption and about a 2% improvement in uh, mechanical efficiency of, of the pedaling stroke. Um, again, are those meaningful? Is that large improvements in uh, these kind of metrics for cycling? Uh, yes, those are substantial improvements. They, they estimate here in the abstract that um, if a cyclist was able to maintain uh, those benefits over a whole hour, like if you're going for the, uh, the, the uh, cycling record where you try to pedal as, as far as you can in one hour, which is a well-known record in cycling, um, with those improvements, you could go about one kilometer further during that hour, which, which would be a, a remarkable improvement. Like if somebody went out tomorrow and broke the one hour uh, cycling record by a kilometer, they, they would have completely smashed that record. That's, that's, that's a remarkable uh, improvement on, upon that record. That's, that's a very big jump. Okay, um, next time you see some bikes out in the wild, um, see, take a look at people's cranks and see if they look more like the crank that uh, I was showing on my bike, a standard crank, or if they look more like this with this goofy looking uh, kind of gear, little gearish mechanism just tacked onto the end of the crank there. Um, I guarantee you probably won't see any cranks that actually look like this. Um, couple reasons for that. Um, this is probably heavier than a standard crank, and that's not a big deal when riding over level ground, but climbing uphill, cyclists who are interested in performance, like avoid weight like the plague, like adding extra weight to your bike is, is a death sentence if you're trying to, to climb up a hill at max effort. Um, this would also be uh, much more expensive to uh, machine and, and to make than a standard crank, and the, uh, the cycling industry, not, not like the cycling the sport, like the athletes, but cycling the, the business, like making and selling bikes and, and uh, parts and accessories for bikes, is an extremely competitive industry. There's a lot of vendors in it, um, a lot of uh, big name, well-known, well-established brands that are very competitive with each other. Um, the margins in terms of like how much profit they make on, on a sale of a bike or on most equipment is, is pretty narrow. They don't make a huge amount of profit on most sales because it's so competitive and they're trying to keep costs down. And so that's, I think, a big reason why you don't see a lot of innovations like this uh, manifest in actual uh, commercial bikes that you can actually buy it at a bike store from a bike vendor. Uh, they're just simply too expensive, even if they are, uh, can, or even if they can be made in a way that doesn't add any substantial weight to the bike, which, which I suspect this one might. So an interesting engineering development here, but if you wanted to uh, produce this in an actual bike, you would have to consider things kind of outside the uh, performance aspect of it in terms of is it going to add too much mass to the bike and, and take away uh, from my performance when I'm going uphill, which is often when, when long races are determined who's the best climber, um, or is it going to be too expensive to, to actually make and, and sell for a reasonable profit. Okay, that is it for today.